जितने भी समय जितने भी शतमान इस्लामिक रूल था आप मुझे एक डायनेस्टी बताइए जहाँ पे ब्लडलेस सक्सेशन हुआ आफ्टर मोहम्मद बिन कासिम द मुस्लिम ब्लड इन्वेडर्स दे वर ऑल मोस्टली फ्रॉम टर्किक स्टॉक इन इस्लामिक पॉलिटिकल स्कीम ऑफ थिंग्स देर इज नो कॉन्सेप्ट ऑफ प्राइवेट प्रॉपर्टी यू आर ऑल प्रॉपर्टी बिलोंग यू नो वॉट वॉज अ मोस्ट यूक्रेटिव प्रोफेशन ड्यूरिंग कैकोबाद शॉर्ट लिव्ड इन योर ओल्डेस्ट प्रोफेशन एब्सोल्यूटली Jalaluddin is universally cursed and reviled by all chroniclers who came uh, who followed in Burmese path. Basically it is called the heart of Quran because it is read at the time of death. Jalaluddin says, "I am hmm, going to meet Alauddin and get the booty from him." This man gets up he says angrily, "If your majesty returns from Kada Manikpur back to Delhi alive, he may chop off my neck with his own sword." Absolutely right. to be here and thank you very much let me have the pleasure of shaking you by the hand as a brit would say <laughs> namaste aap sabhi ka swagat hai aaj ke is tjd podcast mein aur aaj hum baat karne ja rahe hain bharat ke early islamic shaskon ki aur hamare sath baat karne ke liye hain is samay संदीप बालकृष्णा जी स्वागत है आपका संदीप जी जयपुर डायलॉग्स में थैंक यू धन्यवाद आपने एक पुस्तक लिखी है इन फैक्ट यू आर राइटिंग सीरीज ऑफ दीज बुक्स श्रृंखला लिख रहे हैं आप और इट इज कॉल्ड इन्वेडर्स एंड इनफिडल्स तो पहली आपने लिखी थी तो वो मोहम्मद बिन कासिम के आस पास आरम्भ करके और उसको आपने जो दिल्ली सल्तनत का जो पहला फेज था वहाँ तक आपने लिखी थी बलबन तक शायद तो ये जो अर्ली हिस्ट्री आपने लिखी है तो आप पहले ये बताएं कि ये जो सोर्सेज हैं ये सोर्सेज कौन से सोर्सेज हैं जिनका आपने उपयोग लिया फर्स्ट ऑफ ऑल इट्स ऑलवेज ए प्लेजर टू बी बैक ऑन जयपुर डायलॉग्स तो जैसे कि आपने बोला ये श्रृंखला का जो है इन्वेडर्स एंड इन्फिडेंस का वो मोहम्मद बिन कासिम से आरम्भ होता है और पहला वॉल्यूम जो है दिल्ली तक का जो उनका इन्वेजन्स इन्वेजन्स का जो सिलसिला था वो आके बलबन की आ, मौत तक रुकती है और उसके बाद उसके पोते का जो कॉरोनेशन होता है वो होता है सो वहाँ पे ख़त्म होता है आ, पहला पार्ट और दूसरी बुक में वहाँ से वो कंटिन्यू होता है अभी आपका प्रश्न था सोर्सेस के बारे में सोर्सेस के बारे में कई तरह की सोर्सेस यूज किया है लेकिन मुसलमान आक्रांताओं का इतिहास अच्छी तरह से मतलब ट्रूथफुल टू द ओरिजिनल जैसा जो हुआ उनके इतिहासकार बताने वाले इंग्लिश में उनको क्रॉनिकलर्स कहते हैं हिस्टोरियंस नहीं कह सकते क्रॉनिकलर्स जो कोर्ट क्रॉनिकलर्स कोर्ट को कोर्ट क्रॉनिकलर्स जो हाँ मुंशी और उसे थोड़ा ऊपर का <laughs> दर्जा है तो उन्होंने जो लिखा था सो so वो सारे सोर्सेस ऑलमोस्ट मेजॉरिटी ऑफ द सोर्सेस हैव सर्वाइव्ड तो उनको आधार करके उनसे लिया है मैं uh, जो कि इस्लाम के साइड का कहानी बताता है नॉट रिलाइंग टू मच ऑन सेकेंडरी सोर्सेस की इन्होंने ऐसा लिखा तो उनका मैं संक्षेप करके या उसको आधारित करके मैं दूसरे उनको सेकेंडरी सोर्स मिनहास सिराज इज अ प्राइमरी सोर्स राइट सो उनके बेसिस uh, में मैं वो सोर्सेस मैंने यूज किया है बिकॉज इट हैज मोर ऑथेंटिसिटी सत्य के uh, uh, बहुत करीब होता है वो सो दैट इज वन फॉर एग्जाम्पल जैसे ये जो आपका जो एलियट और डाउसन का ये जो हाँ. पूरा का पूरा जो आई थिंक एट वॉल्यूम्स एट वॉल्यूम्स तो ये जो इनका जो हिस्ट्री ऑफ इंडिया तो ये जो इनके वॉल्यूम्स हैं इनको आपने यूज किया होगा हाँ बिल्कुल तो इसमें बिनास सिराज के अलावा और भी हैं बहुत बहुत सारे अलुत भी है फरिश्ता है बहुत सारे हैं भरणी है उस समय के बहुत बहुत सारे हैं and uh, you think they are truthful bilkul they are truthful uh, some of them are 
नाइन्टी परसेंट ट्रूथफुल बट वॉट यू गेट आपको एक स्पष्ट चित्रण मिलेगा रेस्ट यू कैन यू नो यूज योर मेथड्स टू डिराइव हिस्टोरिकल ट्रूथ एंड प्रेजेंट दम इन एज एक्यूरेट फैशन एज पॉसिबल क्योंकि एलियड और डाउसन में जो भी उनके क्रॉनिकल्स हैं उसमें जो भी आता है उसमें तो दे आर शोन एज बैरबेरियंस एंड जिलॉट्स और एक्चुएटेड बाय इस्लामिक फंडामेंटलिज्म बिल्कुल पूरी तरह से शरीयत लागू करने के जिसके कह रहे हैं कि एब्सोल्युटली मैड एंड दे हैव नो कम्पंक्शन इन किलिंग इन दोज जस्ट फॉर देयर रिलीजन जस्ट विच इज़ एंटायरली ट्रू आइडियोलॉजी so one important uh, difference between the aligarh school and say even the allahabad school and their later derivatives most notably uh, romila thapar satish chandra this philos one important difference is that mohammad habib for example he was very keen to whitewash the gory record of islam in india as far as the hindu side of the story was concerned if mohammad habib agar mohammad habib अलाउद्दीन खलजी या मोहम्मद बिन तुगलक या बलबन या औरंगजेब के टाइम में जिंदा था और ऐसा इतिहास लिखता था कि महमूद गजनी या औरंगजेब हिंदुओं का मंदिर इसलिए तोड़ा ताकि वहाँ का जो वेल्थ था संपत्ति था उसको केवल उसको लूटने के लिए तोड़ा अगर वो औरंगजेब के टाइम में जिंदा होकर उस टाइम में ये सब लिखा हुआ होता तो कत्ल हो जाता तो फर्स्ट फर्स्ट विक्टिम ही वुड बी हैंग फॉर अपोस्टेसी एंड इंसल्टिंग द रिलीजन ऑफ इस्लाम करेक्ट सो ही लिव्ड इन अ वास्टली डिफरेंट सर्कमस्टांसेस वेयर मुस्लिम पावर वाज कंप्लीटली क्रश्ड आफ्टर द ब्रेकअप ऑफ मुगल एम्पायर एंड वी नो द रेस्ट ऑफ द हिस्ट्री सो प्लस सेंसिटिविटीज एंड sensibilities in the public discourse had changed to a great extent ki it was looked down upon that these were regarded as acts of extreme barbarism and bigotry so how do you uh, retain your fidelity to your the faith that you're born in plus negate all the uh, cruel acts of bigotry and fanaticism done by the forefathers of the religion that you're born in there is no way but to whitewash these records and to invent uh circumstances that did not exist to use perspectives and prisms and lenses which do not correspond to what they themselves have recorded so this is a chief difference between the mohammad habib school and uh the marxist so called marxist school these are not schools of history don't insult the term school it has a very pious connotation in my uh, mental scape it is not a school both of them are basically ideological pamphleteering okay disguised as history historiography even if you recast the isla history of islamic period in india using the prism of economics which they claim to do yes irfan abi chief uh, uh, chief mm-hmm. irfan abi but motivated primarily by uh, uh, his father mohammad abi mm-hmm. even if you use that you can still make a claim that these economic uh, factors uh, which uh, wrote the uh, dark chapter of uh, islamic history in india were still motivated by religion even if you do this <laughs> अच्छा बात करेंगे आपके जहाँ से पहला जो आपका वॉल्यूम समाप्त होता है वो बलबन बल का जो तो बलबन का क्या रिकॉर्ड है बैर बैरिटी का हाँ तो, तो बलबन अगेन ये तो बोलना ही पड़ेगा जितने भी समय जितने भी शतमान इस्लामिक रूल था आप मुझे एक डायनेस्टी बताइए जहाँ पे ब्लडलेस सक्सेशन हुआ है 
وہ تو اسلام میں پرائمو کانسیپٹ نہیں ہے نا تو اٹ ہیز آلویز بین یوسر پیشن اور مرڈر وہ تو سیم پری مچ رائٹ اٹ از ناٹ بین لیجیٹیمیٹ سکسیشن کی پتا سے بیٹے کو گیا یا بھائی سے بھائی کو گیا وتھ آؤٹ مرڈر وتھ آؤٹ خلافت عثمانیہ کا بھی یہ رہا جی جی بالکل بالکل سو یو ہیو ٹو پٹ دیٹ ان یو نو کیپ اٹ ان مائنڈ ٹو انڈرسٹینڈ واٹ فالوز تو بلبن ہی ہیڈ یو نو لانگ ٹرم ایمبیشنس بٹ ہی کڈ ناٹ ریئلائز اٹ بیکاز ہی کیم آفٹر التت مش ہی کنٹ ریئلائز ہز ڈریمس بیکاز دیر واز اے ویری پاورفل کلیک آف ٹرکک نوبلس ہی واز پارٹ آف دیٹ کلیک ایک جو شڈینتر بولتے ہیں نا جو دیٹ واٹ از دیٹ کال کلیک فیکشن کا جو ہے سو ہی واز پارٹ آف دیٹ گروپ اٹ از کالڈ ڈریڈیڈ فورٹی میننگ ڈریڈیڈ فورٹی کیبل آف فورٹی ٹرکک نوبلس اینڈ دے ور یو نو آؤٹ سائڈ دے ور آل ڈرنکنگ بڈیز اینڈ یو نو تھوڑا سا اس کو کلیئر کر رہے ہیں کہ جیسے جو ہوری جو تھا محمد اکبر وہ تو افغان تھا ہاں جی تو یہ ترکستان والے کیوں کیوں اس کے ساتھ میں نا دا ارلی وتھ دا آفٹر محمد بن قاسم دا مسلم بلڈ انویجن انویڈرس دے ور آل موسٹلی فرام ٹرکک اسٹاک Uh, I am unsure if uh, Muhammad uh, Ghori's antecedents are Afghan. I don't think so. Okay. They are Turkic. Okay. As far as I know, uh, as far as uh, I know, it is, uh, he was originally from, uh, I mean, his uh, lineage was uh, Turkic. But uh, there is also one uh, history about his lineage, which says that his forefathers were Buddhists. Okay. In uh, Afghanistan. I think we have to tell the viewers that the original Turkestan mm. is uh, something different. It is, it is, it is not, not is, it was what pa- Turkey is today. Yes, yes. It is part of, it, it was it is, part of what it is, is known today's as Kazakhstan, Kazakhstan Uzbekistan, Kyrgyzstan, Kyrgyzstan Tazakistan, yes, Turkmenistan. Turkmenistan. These five Central Asian countries, the original Turkestan and East Turkestan East of Turkist- China. China, correct. which is uh, Xi'an. All of this was part of Brihad Bharata, culturally. It was under the cultural sphere of India's influence. Uttarakuru. Uh, Uttarakuru. You can take it. Where does Gandhari come from? Gandhar is in Afghanistan. Kandahar today. Uh, Afghanistan. Hmm, Afghanistan. So, wo hai. So, uh, so, he was part of... Uh, Kabul, Zabul. Uh, uh, he, uh, Balban was part of that cabal. While they were all, you know, outwardly drinking buddies and, you know, I will give you to my friends, this kind of outward thing. Everybody nursed an ambition to become Sultan. But no one dared to do it because the peer age was cutthroat, literally cutthroat. And Balban nursed that ambition. He installed his own son-in-law as a Sultan. Okay. Nasiruddin. His hmm. name? نصیر الدین صاحب جسٹ نیم سے جو پورا یہ جو پیریڈ ہے آپ کا محمد غوری سے لے کے بلبن تک کا یہ کتنے سال کا ہے اور اس میں کتنے سلطان ہوئے گوری سے لے کے آئی ول ڈسکاؤنٹ گوری وی ول بگن دا اسٹوری وتھ گوری سلیو قطب الدین آئی بک سو آئی بک سے لے کے بلبن تک رفلی اباؤٹ ایٹی ٹو نائنٹی ایئرس اینڈ دیٹ پیریڈ سو ریکارڈ نمبر آف ٹویلو اور تھرٹین sultans out of which only four or five were actual sultans who had full political control iltutmish uh, yeah I've, i mean aibak died very soon so you had iltutmish uh, you had uh, balban pretty much those two just those two those two pretty much and that. they are the only ones who had decent career uh, decent careers yeah long enough careers to count to wo tha and uh, he installed nasiruddin as uh, sultan No, name sake sultan but he he controlled everything. controlled everything from behind the scenes and the main source of his power was this nobility and nasiruddin was so shrewd unko malum tha ki main kamzor hu to main kyu na main ek acha sultan to ek powerful sultan nahi ban paya lekin ek acha musalman banunga so he would copy the verses from quran and you know where that skull cap and do namaz in public these things so that endeared him to his muslim uh, uh, citizens and then 
he also developed ambition obviously with such a domineering father in law ab main sultan hu kisi aur ko hukum mujhko sunna padega so his ambition was stirred by a former hindu who had been forcibly converted his name his muslim name is imaduddin rehan so in one stroke uh, listening to this rehan's uh, uh, you know advice he dismissed all the nobility including balban <laughs> and then balban uh, said acha beta tum ye khel khel rahe ho cheat ke par nikal aaye ha ha ye khel khel rahe ho mujhe bhi aata hai so he did nothing for one entire year then he marshaled up all his sources forces and laid a siege to delhi on this side of yamuna you had the, the full strength of balban and the armies of his allies on the other side nasuruddin was isolated so he said i will i am offering you peace balban bolta hai main shanti se hi aaya hu I, i am your slave i am the slave of the sultan and i always will be so nasiruddin got the message so he said no you know you are elder to me you have to honor me and you know come back all is forgotten and then balban said i want imaduddin rehan's head so that fellow was transferred to some far away ikta and then he was murdered later and uh, most of these chroniclers now we come to that point they are silent about what happened to nasiruddin hmm. but if you do a close reading of these histories you will know that he was eventually murdered by balban and after balban became sultan he began to sideline his former colleagues his peers ruthless guy i think all of them did that completely ruthless the degree is different hmm. and uh, he centralized the administration to such an extent that he had cultivated an extraordinary network of spies to jo unke purane dost jo the na so unke ghar mein you know on flimsy grounds he would drag them out parade them naked in public have them stoned to death on flimsy grounds so you do this to three or four nobles you know confiscate their property literally their families on the streets because in islamic political scheme of things the empire your there is no concept of private property you are all property belongs to allah pro- yeah mm. 7.128 so, yeah. quran yeah you yeah. know better <laughs> chapter verse uh, and who is a caretaker here of allah's dominions is this sultan so he is the agent is the agent of you yeah. you hold your wealth and property your home your family at the whim and mercy of the sultan so he you do this kind of thing to three or four uh, aristocrats rest will fall in line so he banned liquor he banned alcoholic parties he banned uh, all things that are said to be haram so this he would surround himself with uh, huge sturdy bodyguards who would always wield you know uh, life size uh, swords so that is to exude your uh, dominance and your ruthlessness to wo tha then he began to encourage myths about himself that you know he has a divine descent what was the extent of his uh, his rule, rule did rule. not extend for uh, it was less than uh, less than 20 years uh, less than 20 years but yeah. what was the territorial extent yeah so not just balban the territorial extent of all alleged sultans in delhi in the alleged delhi so called delhi sultanate it did not extend beyond a radius of 120 kilometers in north and northwest india just that just that much <laughs> and we we read reams and reams about the delhi sultanate and it is and not and we had much it, larger it, it doesn't it, much larger no, no, kingdom it doesn't end at that the two more factors to this territorial thing most of the time let's say you score a decisive victory over one hindu king who was ruling that and you wrest that uh, kingdom from him that area from him in two ways either you completely crush him and snatch it or you reduce that fellow to a vassal or a feud right in both cases 
there was always a danger of rebellion. Revolt rather, not rebellion, revolt. One. Two, with each succession in the, on the throne of Delhi, lot of the, all these territories would have to be reconquered. Why, okay. <laughs> so this is also the other dimensions to this uh, uh, territory business. So that was uh, Balban, but his... Oh, we can safely say that actually the uh, Islamic rule would have begun only after Alauddin Khilji. Yes. Yes. The real Islamic rule the, in India. Yeah, the proper spread of Islamic political power occurred after Alauddin Khilji. So you can safely discount about 150 years. Easily. So all this talk about we ruled India for 800 years, 800, 900. Mm -hmm. Actually, it begins it's from around bantam. 1300 starts. It all, it's all, bantam. and it ends in 1707. Less than, less than that. Almost nearly 400 years at the most. Of effective best. rule. Of effective rule, and in between also they were, between, yeah. they were periods in which their power waned. Waned, yeah. So uh, how does Balban? Uh, Okay, Balban dies finally. Yeah. But uh, what happens after that? So, uh, Balban dies and he, before his death, he summons a group of his close confidants and he entrusts the, his sultanate to his grandson, who is all of 15 years old, maybe 16. His name is Kaikubad. Mm. And Kaikubad has been brought up in a very orthodox, strict Islamic fashion, and I quote, trained under the watchful eyes of the most uh, uh, pious ulema who did not allow the boy, uh, who did not allow the boy's eyes to even cast a glance at uh, the fairer sex. And he was trained in all sorts of manly exercises. But it all went waste. <laughs> Within three months of him becoming <laughs> Sultan, this kid, all his teenage passions just exploded in one go. <laughs> and within one and a half years of him being an alleged Sultan, he abandoned the throne of Delhi. He built a pleasure palace dedicated to this, these activities, drinking and partying and other things which cannot be mentioned. Mm. Licentiousness. Okay. He built a Jannat basically. Jannat basically, <laughs> yeah. Across, you know, in a new city, he created a new city out there dedicated to this thing. Mm. And he began to rule from there. Mm. And the administration just. What, what is that city? Hilugari. Okay. Yeah. So Where is some, it located? Uh, Delhi, uh, outskirts of Delhi. Okay. There's some ruins out there. Mm. You can see the tourist guide in Delhi. It'll be interesting to. Note what it is. Your viewers can Google it. We, we are showing it to the people. So, so that, that was a pleasure house anyway. Uh, a royal brothel if you will. Uh, Jannat. Jannat. <coughs> so, administration. Jan Jannat-e Kaikubad. So, yeah, jannat -e So, what happens to the administration? The prices of essential commodities went up. You know what was the most lucrative profession? During Kaikobad's short-lived tenure. The oldest profession? Absolutely. <laughs> Second oldest profession. <laughs> oldest profession is politics. Second is Second this. <laughs> so that became the most lucrative thing. And, you know, inflation went up to something like 300, 400%, things like that. But to his credit, Kaikobad realized that he was a waste He was useless. So... In one, one awakening of sanity, he summoned a 70-year-old man, a battle-hardened general, now also the governor of a rich province called Samana. He summoned him, appointed him as the minister for war. His name was Jalaluddin Khalji. Okay. So this was the last sane decision, sane <laughs> comparatively, relatively speaking, that Kaikubad took. Mm. So that begins, uh, with that he had signed his death warrant. Right. That begins a new chapter after which the uh, Kaikubad was murdered at the instigation of Jalaluddin Khalji. 
and uh, he was literally kicked to death and okay. thrown in the yamuna river and with that the so called slave dynasty comes to an end and with that the political power of the turkic muslims comes to an end in india khiljis are afans uh, uh, they are they i mean according to some uh, there's a beautiful uh, uh, research paper by minorsky uh, the turkish origin of the khalji dialect bahut acha hai bahut hi badhiya research hai there uh, he traces the origins of khalji as uh, turkic uh, 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 nomads generally in the region of central asia but uh, given their wandering nature they settled in afghanistan and mingled with uh, the local population to such an extent that they were regarded as afghans in popular uh, culture and society and you know that inherited memory right so this is uh, the brief origins of khalji the khalji. khalj tribe so khalj so what does jalaluddin khalji do when kaikobad is on his deathbed two factions are formed one is a faction which is uh, uh, loyal to the house of balban they trace their you know well being and their fortune to balban and they also are proud of their so called pure turkic blood so that is obviously it's all political and plus there is this racial and tribal thing also and the khaljis they have always been regarded as low bred as a class of low bred that is the exact word or low born tribe but they have been uh, under jalaluddin and other people uh, they have risen in economic and uh, military status in a way of speaking so they also form part of the nobility but they don't have the same peerage with uh, uh, the superior turkic blood so these factions are formed and uh, uh, two brothers are there aitmar surkha and aitmar kachan so they want to eliminate uh, uh, khalji because they are the greatest threat jalaluddin and his followers they form the greatest threat to this uh, balban loyalists तो क्या होता है कि द स्फोर्ट्स आर शार्पन एंड इन अ बिट फॉर द सुप्रीमेसी ऑफ द थ्रोन द दीज टू ब्रदर्स द बर्बन लॉयलिस दे इंस्टॉल कईकूबाद इन्फेंट ही सम फाइव इयर्स ओल्ड और सिक्स इयर्स ओल्ड दे ड्रैग हिम फ्रॉम द हेर एम पुट हिम ऑन द थ्रोन कॉरोनेट हिम एंड से यू आर दुल्तान यू आर आर सुल्तान फ्रॉम द वॉन तो कैकोबाद की जगह पर उसका एक छोटा सा इन्फेंट जो है उसको तख्त पे बिठाने की कोशिश की जाती है नहीं बिठा दी गई उनको सल्तनत का पूरा शहनशाह बना दिया हाँ बना दिया शहनशाह बना दिया बिल्कुल उसके बाद क्या हुआ द फुल फाइट एरप्टेड अभी एक सुल्तान तो है तो देर आर नो क्लेमेंट्स देर ओनली लॉयलिस्ट एंड फैक्शनिस्ट लेकिन सुल्तान को किसने बनाया एतमार कच्चन एंड हिज ब्रदर सो दे गेट अ बिगर शेयर ऑफ द स्पॉइल्स और और द सल्तनेट टू व्हाट वॉट एवर इट वॉज वर्थ एंड अ लिस्ट वॉज ड्रॉन अप लिस्ट टू पर्ज लिस्ट बेसिकली अनसरप्राइजिंगली द नेम ऑफ जलालुद्दीन खलजी वॉज नंबर वन इन दैट लिस्ट so this man was he came up through the ranks basically <laughs> jalaluddin battle hardened uh, warrior and kuch tha usme stuff tha so he figured out that tk if i remain here hmm. mujhko ye khatam kar denge so he you know decamped left delhi and went off to a place about 30 miles outside delhi and he gathered all his loyalists from across the whatever empire was there hmm. and then there was some kind of a stand off uske baad the full battle erupted and uh, delhi was stormed by the uh, by jalaluddin and his followers his army and uh, uh, one of the both aitmar kachan and his brother they were killed long story short 
the rebel group they pretty much surrendered to jalaluddin and they said boss you become the sultan we accept defeat you become the sultan so he became the sultan but he didn't immediately become the sultan mm-hmm. he had uh, uh, one unfinished business what he also did jalaluddin after you know accepting the surrender he kidnapped that kid literally kidnapped that kid and you know sent him to a safe hideout and had him murdered then he also instigated one uh, soldier who had been ill treated you know whose father was killed by uh, kaikobad and he said dekho ye revenge ka bahut acha mauka hai wahan pe pada hai kaikobad jaake usko maar do so he literally kicked him to death and after that jalaluddin khalji became the alleged sultan isme ek aur bhi story aati hai na jisme nizamuddin auliya seems to have blessed jalaluddin khalji that yeah hmm. i mean there are so many Hameen, stories yeah, yeah. delhi durast ha ha delhi durast hmm. is uh, that term also occurs during uh, balban's fight for the throne hmm. so when uh, balban is camped with his forces across yamuna and uh, some of his people say ki jaake you capture delhi he said that is when he says delhi durast balban this this term is attributed to many many kings okay yeah so fir jalaluddin khalji ha uh, he ban jaate hain sultan ban jaate hain sultan aur sultan banne ke baad fir unki kya harkatein hain uh, ha unki harkat e sharif ha uh, harkat e sharif बहुत ज्यादा नहीं है लेकिन काफी कलरफुल हरकतें हैं ही रिवॉर्ड्स यू नो ऑल द स्पॉइल्स ऑफ ऑफिस टू हिज लॉयलिस्ट हु हेल्प हिम इन बिकमिंग द सुल्तान जलालुद्दीन इज अ वेरी इंटरेस्टिंग कैरेक्टर स्टडी ही हैज कन्फेस्ड इन सो मेनी वर्ड्स दैट यू नो इफ आई हैड बीन लेफ्ट टू माई सेल्फ टू माइंड माई ओन बिजनेस इफ आई नॉट बीन प्रवोक बाई दोस टू रिचेस i would have spent the rest of my years happily as a governor i did not want this takht mujhe nahi chahiye tha i was not an ambitious uh, man uh, but circumstances forced me and you know things like that as soon as he becomes sultan he uh, he does not enter the city of delhi for one full year he also shifted his capital i'll tell you he he does not enter the city of delhi because inside he has always been a courtier courtier he is completely awed by the power and the alleged majesty of balban to kuch log aise hote hain ki they you know mera the original badsha hi badsha hai ashraf pasmanda problem ha 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 something like that <laughs> so the, he had that in his psyche so for one full year he did not enter uh, the red palace built by balban and after that he enters but before that he stands outside the palace he takes off his headgear and he kisses the ground uh, before the palace and begins to weep he says look main iska layak nahi hu main iska qabil nahi hu that i should enter this magnificent uh, building built by my master balban wo usi delusion mein hai then he goes and ascends the throne and sits and starts weeping again and his courtiers are horrified ki this is not how sultans behave first thing is that they should be ruthless there are no friends for a sultan no family no nothing only power at any cost so they also see that okay acha ye to pehle se hi boda hai <laughs> so they see their chance <laughs> okay and uh, he all the fight is gone from jalaluddin after he becomes uh, uh, sultan there is a lasting sense of guilt you know i'm sitting on something which on unearned empire undeserving i'm i am unearned unearned and therefore i am undeserving of it perhaps he is the only freak in the entire islamic history of india who was an unwilling sultan okay to bahut hi zabardast character study hai then he spends his time uh, wooing his courtiers instead of ruling them okay he woos them mm. 
keep every <laughs> night there is a party every night there is some entertainment you know this kind of thing wo karta hai and then uh, uh, he builds what he does is that pleasure palace that kaikubad had built it was only uh, it was incomplete so he finishes that he furnishes with a elaborate garden you know huge lavish garden erect some kind of a, a beautiful building opposite that that kilugari uh, palace was Kilugari. built on the uh, kilugari kilugari hmm. it was built on the banks of yamuna so on the other side he built some kind of embankment or some quasi fort some kind of a fortification thing beautifies the whole place and he shifts his residence and his seat of government out there balban so unimaginatively he calls it shahar e nau means new city or new town mm. so that's what he calls it and that's from there he continues his alleged government for he rules for less than 7 years jalaluddin and in those 7 years he is confronted with uh, two major rebellions revolts and uh, the first is by uh, balban's nephew which uh, ends in miserable failure he is caught and beheaded the second is by his own nephew kam son in law his name is alauddin kalchi that succeeds literally it is a blood soaked episode uh, in which jalaluddin loses his life i think uh, it would be nice if we recount uh, how jalaluddin got misled by this character but before that uh, uh, i believe it happened uh, far away from delhi the place called kala hmm kara hmm kada okay kala kala kada manikpur kala we will uh, come to that but before that there is a beautiful uh, a very revealing episode in uh, jalaluddin's uh, short lived career there is a dervish a sufi saint named sidi maula he is a maula maulana in turn he is a disciple of uh, fariduddin ganshakar uh he comes from a place called ajodhan which is now in uh, pakistan yeah faridkot uh, is yeah. the place where he used to live yeah so he is taught under that fellow sufi guy and he and he comes to delhi and adopts a very quaint and a very uh, bizarre kind of a lifestyle for a dervish he has a lavish khanka you know, almost resembling a palace in its extent and its magnificence like i said he leads a bizarre life he does not go to any public mosque to offer prayers he offers it in private in his khanka he is dressed like a whatever in rags basically very simple austere lifestyle he does not own any slaves he does not have any concubines and he does not have any money but he has a lot of money his his uh, 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 his kanka is extremely opulent meaning it is overflowing with money which he does not use personally 24 bar 7 his kitchen is open and on any given time about uh, 500 pounds of mutton 700 or 1000 pounds of chicken that is fowl and uh, a few quintals of rice and different vegetables butter ghee everything it is on demand any muslim poor rich traveler pilgrim whoever could take shelter there and food was supplied round the clock so what is the source of his funding so the rumor went around delhi that you know he was well versed in the art of kimya va simya meaning alchemy and black magic or magic that was a rumor that went around and he rises in stature eventually steadily and uh, in the mid term of jalaluddin's rule about two or three years into his uh, regime this man is almost running a parallel government and jalaluddin's spies keep uh, uh, sending this intelligence about 
Sidi Maula, and one day, one, one chronicler writes that Jalaluddin went in disguise and witnessed what was happening in Sidi Maula's Kanka. What he saw horrified him. He said, you know, this is an alleged man of God. How come, you know, he can afford so much? Then it is revealed to him ki Jalaluddin's eldest son, his name is not coming to me right now, his eldest son <clears throat> is one of the major donors to this fellow's Kanka. Obviously, that man attracts a lot of following and Jalaluddin's eldest son is a very, very ambitious man. So, eventually, Sidi Maula uh, hatches a plot with a Qazi, with a former disgraced wrestler named Hatia. He's a Hindu, former Hindu. And uh, another uh, general or one of those army officers, bunch of four, of four to six people, they hatch a plot and, you know, they have rosy dreams about the future where Sidi Maula will become the Sultan. And uh, remember Nasiruddin? His daughter will be married to this Sidi Maula. So these kinds of plots are being hatched, elaborate plans. Within two hours, the plot is leaked. And Sidi Maula is dragged into full court, beaten severely. And, uh, you know, Jalaluddin uh, tells him, ki, what does a man of God have to do with politics? It's a very, very gory episode. Uh, Jalaluddin orders uh, some other dervishes of a different order. This is the Kalandari order. Sufi, Kalandari Sufi. Namadam Mast Kalandar. So, no, they are, <clears throat> I think they are basically Kadris. Yeah. Kalandaris, but uh, Ganchakar was uh, a Chishti. Hmm. No, Ganchakar could, could be a Chishti, but the story I am seeing. Sidi Maula would be a Chishti. In that he would be a Chishti. He would be a Chishti. Just like Nizamuddin. Nizamuddin Aliya. Yeah. So, Jalaluddin orders these uh, Kalandari Sufis uh, to say, you know, what are you doing, you know, looking at this fellow who's involved himself in a plot against the Sultan's life? Won't you avenge me? So, one Kalandari, he gets up and slashes Sidi Maula on the sides with his razor, both sides of his body. And then begins to beat him with uh, prayer beads, which we Rudraksh, bolte na, beads, prayer beads. They are made of stone. And begins, you know, uh, begins to hammer him with that. Some other dervishes join the assault. And, you know, it's a brutal torture. And Jalaluddin is sitting back on his throne and enjoying the whole spectacle. And finally, you know, his eldest son, uh, no, his second son, gets an elephant and has Sidi Maula trampled. Okay. Bye-bye, Sidi Maula. Bye-bye, Sidi Maula. So this is, a, <laughs> this is a very, very interesting episode because, uh, you know, it reveals the whole thing about uh, several insights into the uh, power of the ulema over the Muslim community. And also the status, the real status of the ulema as the spiritual and religious advisors to a sultan. See, the powers of the Sufis had declined by the time uh, Nizamuddin Aulia set shop yes. there. Yeah, yeah. And it happened because uh, Nizamuddin is almost, uh, in fact, uh, so I think a few years, a few decades after Al Ghazali dies. Yes. Okay, Al Ghazali. Died in the beginning Nizamuddin of the 12th yeah. century. Mm. And this guy is late 12th century. Late 12th century. He outlasted four uh, Muslim sultans. I know. So, uh, till Al Ghazali, the Sufis were treated as different from the people who followed Sharia. The, correct, correct. The, the, uh, the, the, you, you know ortho, all that. Orthodox. Yes, that Orders, fight yeah. that happened between yes, yes, the yes. Mutazalis and Ashari, and Ashari, Ashari yeah. the Sharia people. Yes, yes. And ultimately, the Sharia people triumphed because they Al Ghazali, triumphed, yeah. a Sufi himself, so, yeah. favored the Ashari. Favored, yeah. And uh, after that, uh, in the um, entire Islamic lore, the reforms have been forbidden mostly. Yes. yes. 
because of this incident yeah, and uh, <clears throat> yeah so istida istihad mm. the reform reform so istihad was actually banned by Allah it was Allah. banned yes and nizamuddin auliya follows soon after mm. but uh, uh, whatever i have read about nizamuddin auliya himself mm. in fact there's a beautiful book which has recently come out on nizamuddin auliya himself when it's when was this published m a khan m a khan recent is it uh, uh, yeah it is recent and uh, he fully subordinated himself mm mm-hmm. to the political power not just to the political power but also to the uh, ulama mm. who were doing this who, who were actually initiating this sharia sharia mm. so that's why they say that tariqat became subordinate to the sharia to the sharia ha huh. correct so it happened around about uh, this, this time a good point yeah good point yeah. indeed yeah so, so tariqat had become subordinate to the to, sharia to sharia by the time of uh, mm. nizamuddin auliya yeah which was probably not the case at the time mm. of moinuddin chishti mm. yeah i mean moinuddin moinuddin chishti was uh, highly politically active in one sense not in just one sense but in many senses that he had his political antenna always uh, up and running because al ghazali's teachings had not really filtered down to india down to india time. at that time correct by that time Absolutely. but they did uh, by the time nizamuddin came yes in And fact uh, uh, ganshakar before uh, sidi maulas you know said okay i'm going to hindustan in their final parting meeting he gives one piece of advice that listen sidi maula be very very careful about one thing no mulla no imam no man of god no sufi no dervish who became intimate with either the ruling power or the house of the ruling power or its aristocracy has suffered anything but evil so be careful about your close association with politics that was his parting message but sidi maula was an ambitious man and that's how he met his end it's a very very illustrative episode when you look at the uh, details so that is a uh, notable thing but what follows sidi maula's death is in, uh, is even more revealing every islamic chronicler of india including sidi maula's contemporaries like barani barani and sidi maula were you know friends uh, amir khusro i don't remember what he says about sidi maula but uh, barani was his contemporary yeah he holds he curses jalaluddin khalji that you know you killed a man of god kill the pure you know a dervish and everybody every chronicler after barney was probably barney, more fanatical than extremely the fanatical you know his uh, book called uh, the rules of kings or something translate in uh, title of the book rules for kings or something he wants to recreate 7th century arabia in india yes he wanted the shafai order to be uh-huh. very prevalent here yes yes because yes. the hanafis he was a total liberalist in that sense because the hanafis the central asians were hanafis hanafis yeah and uh, of course if we go into detail in that why the hanafis spared the no that uh, digress something uh, yeah, else yeah why they spared the um, uh, people who were not of the book not of the book it was mainly for practical reasons absolutely because they were going into central asia yes which was being ruled by mongols by Bo- mm, mongols so the strict laws cannot <coughs> apply. so the strict laws could not be applied could not be applied. so they use more of deceit yes in fact in, <coughs> if you, if you uh, read the history of uh, jazia a lot of these conflicting uh, uh, so called alleged judgments about the actual method of imposing jazia uh, uh, this i forget his name Jazia and the Spread of Islam is the name of the book. Fantastic uh, uh, first-hand material is available. But anyway, like I said, we keep digressing. So this is the story of Sidi Maula. He is universally uh, not he Jalaluddin is universally crushed, uh, cursed, and reviled by all chroniclers who came uh, who followed in Barani's path. That happens later on when Muhammad Tughlaq came. Muhammad hmm. Tughlaq uh, he also did something different in the sense that 
लिफ्टेड दी बार ऑन बार टू सूफी टू सूफी एंड नॉट टू सैयद टू सैयद एंड सूफी and uh, for that he is revived to be revived for that yeah that will come in all, all that following you, you know, see that you talk yeah, yeah. of yes, yes, yes because yes. of this so what happens after that yeah so that is uh, one episode then uh, as uh, a reward for uh, putting down the review the not review the revolt of his nephew his name is malik chajju he is balban's nephew so he is ruling from kada kada manikpur hmm. then he is imprisoned killed and you know stuff mm-hmm. happens uh then that fief that ikta is given as a reward to alauddin khalji who is jalaluddin's nephew come son in law and once alauddin goes there his ambition is always had been an ambitious man once he goes there he begins an elaborate and a very very well planned strategy to capture the throne and to do that he has learned lessons from the botched up revolt of malik chaju so he realizes that the main ingredient required for success to capture the takht is money how to raise money by plundering other kingdoms so for the first time he gets intelligence about uh, the fabulous wealth accumulated by the infidel king ruling from devagiri daulatabad devagiri and he plans a elaborate campaign he lies to jalaluddin khalji he says i'm going to plunder uh, uh, chanderi which is in madhya pradesh one of the great centers of jainism so he goes to chanderi but he he doesn't enter the city he changes his route goes all the way to devagiri plunders it fabulous amounts of money and then begins plunging gold and wealth across his way to uh, capture delhi ultimately but when jalaluddin hears this news he so deluded that when he is informed his spies and officers tell him look this man is dangerous he wants to kill you and take over your throne but his delusion is so advanced that he says no he is like my son i have raised him since he was an infant ye hota hai sultanat ka politics correct i have raised him since an infant and i have given him so many favors so this kada manikpur is a very lucrative territory lies bit on opposite banks of uh, ganga in uttar pradesh kada dham kada dham kada dham kada dham ha ardu kazmi hills from there thank you ji phir aage kya hota hai phir aage kya hota hai he misleads him and uh, jalaluddin is obviously deluded you know we the scheme of succession in the islamic political uh, textbook or system this is the same there is thing. no place for us there is no no <laughs> wo ek hai the other important thing uh, you know incidental thing is that alauddin's brother almas beg he is also another nephew and another son in law of jalaluddin and uh, both of them conspire so but you know when jalaluddin is informed of this treachery slowly he realizes ki there could be some truth in what these people are saying but Alauddin has completely taken over the psychology of uh, Jalaluddin. He knows the old man's greed, insatiable lust for wealth. You know, at seventy or seventy-two, he uh, goes on an expedition to capture Ranasthambhapura, Ranthambore, that fort. But he comes back, you know, uh, without any success. But on the way, or before that, he has looted. small smaller hindu provinces but which were you know teeming with wealth and then he enters uh, uh, delhi and you know how amir khusro describes him this guy was 72 years old okay and obviously when the sultan returns to the city there's great pomp and show people are you know on their terraces but how amir khusro 
describes that you know he says you know people were very happy to see the old sultan who was mounted on the elephant like a royal lion uh, you know all kinds of adjectives and then all the young unmarried virgins looking at the lion like sultan's handsome face cast away their bridal garments and wept in the throes of separation that they could not marry this handsome king <laughs> I mean, I also, was also a big chap. He oh, one of outlasted the, some. Yeah, some six sultans. <laughs> Extraordinary character. <laughs> Extraordinary. This yeah. man is seventy to Buddha. Hai. So um, and we, he early, wants us to believe early, six years. Fair, yeah. youthful, virgin uh, damsels uh, are all yeah. pining for him. Yeah, yeah. Sola Baraska, you know, Umar. Hmm. Uh, they are all besotted with this handsome old sultan. but he can never uh, you know their love will be unrequited oh this kind of poetry unrequited love my god ha to ye hai anyway so uh, jalaluddin has a uh, unquenchable thirst for money like all sultans and alauddin has understood this so he plays on that psyche plus he plays on that old sultan's emotions so like i said a while back after jalaluddin becomes the king the fight has gone out of him now he wants to be loved and not respected and feared he wants to die as a pious muslim because he is afraid that you know in his old age he has to face the judgment day and he is unsure whether he will be regarded in the eyes of allah as a pious muslim so all such things he does and this alauddin very crafty man actually is one of a kind you know you set as it all his bigotry and all that extremely devious crafty guy actually great planner great strategist and he has a pulse on people's psyches you know what triggers them and how it triggers them when to play the instrument which string on the violin should be played so he is has him in his grip so he keep sending him his letters uh, uh, messages alauddin that look i want to come to the sultan's gracious court magnificent court and kiss your the dust at your feet and present all my booty but i am afraid that people around you aapke jo aas paas log jo hai aapke close circle mein they would have poisoned your mind against me against me so what if they kill uh, you know kill me or what if you kill me in a fit of anger i am actually afraid i am not plotting don't doubt me he keeps doing this and you know it is i mean that precision with which his messages are delivered and the exact wordings i mean it's an art in itself so if that is not enough and the temptation the beat you know he keeps thinking it you know just tantalizing it it's, it's, yahan pe yahan pe and then one also keeps telling him what kind of wealth he, uh, has, he has what for him graphic descriptions then his brother almas beg is at delhi he is not accompanied allowed in to uh, devagiri so those two are co conspirators so he keeps instructing almas beg what to say and how to say it to the sultan and uh, almas beg in a final message decisive message he tells jalaluddin that you know whatever my brother has said he is like a son to you remember is entirely true he fears for his uh, life and he is contemplating uh, two decisions uh, you know if your majesty does not uh, accede to his prayer he will uh, take all his wealth and go away to bengal Mm. Bengal of that time was a uninhabitable territory, large parts of it actually, and you know for someone to come, marshy land mostly. Ma- yeah, yeah. So he is contemplating that decision. Mm. Number two, my dear brother, poor fellow, is distraught. He always carries in his pocket a poisonous kerchief. So you know, if his fear of of, of the Sultan overtakes him, he will just sniff it. and in his life so this works this psychological trick works and jalaluddin sets out to meet alauddin at kada with a very small force huge rain i mean this is a 
a movie can be made on just this episode kuch faltu ka film banate rehte ye log you take just this episode and make a movie anyway uh peak rainy season monsoon jalaluddin goes the roads are all blocked because the rivers are overflowing and uh, jalaluddin's till the end one one or two people remain completely loyal to jalaluddin rest are all self servers and flatterers so uh, he is also his nephew sister son uh ahmed chap i think is his name malik ahmed chap so he repeatedly warns and in one final meeting he gets up in fury claps his hand and says when allah, jalaluddin says ki you know i am going to meet alauddin and get the booty from him so this man gets up he says angrily if your majesty returns from kada manikpur back to delhi alive he may chop off my neck with his own sword absolutely right so he takes the land route and jalaluddin goes to meet alauddin uh but this man he called him to kada but when kada and manikpur on opposite sides of the bank of ganga and uh, when he goes there about 3 or 4 days before jalaluddin comes alauddin has taken all his booty and all his army on the opposite bank and uh, even then jalaluddin doesn't realize what has happened so these are all graphic descriptions by the chroniclers Such even people do not deserve to be so yeah <laughs> so even then for one full day <clears throat> for one full day or two days jalal alauddin doesn't even show his face and this guy has reached kada he's reached kada and he's almost begging and almas beg is with him he says why is it why has my son become so hard hearted that he doesn't want to show me his face so he says no this is ramzan it is the month of ramzan and uh, he is busy preparing a lavish feast for you he is instructing the cooks with this you know personally instructing the cooks uh to prepare dishes that your majesty loves and then finally jalaluddin sits in the boat accompanied by less than 10 of his closest courtiers confidants along with almas big he's brought a proper army with him a uh, very few in number but it is an army nevertheless in case you know something happens almas big says these people your force should not come otherwise alauddin will run away or sniff the handkerchief <laughs> you see the bait at every step ha huh? <laughs> and this man with some five or six people the sultan he sits in the boat and is crossing the river and on the other as he sights the bank he sees not only just alauddin at the front he sees his entire army even then he is not alarmed he asked almas beg he says what is the meaning of this itne sare fauj yahan kyu hain so almas beg says this is again for his majesty's benefit this is a show of strength jaise hum republic day parade and you know all these things you make a show of strength ki you know all this force is at his majesty's disposal and alauddin wants to you know show how the preparedness of his fauj but his uh, confidence his officials they are under no illusions at this point of time so even as he's having these conversations with almas beg he is reading the quran because it's ramzan these people his officers are reading a different passage in surah in quran i think it is known as a heart of quran you you know we have read that book better than me i have but basically it is called the heart of quran because it is read at the time of death okay it is read at the time of death um, that you know whatever may allah liberate my thing or whatever something is there uh, i've given the uh, i remember surah. that passage that is that uh, mm. we have come from allah and we shall ah yeah yeah exactly yeah we That's shall meet him uh, we shall be allah rajiun in, in, in some, face of death something rajiun something yeah yeah in <laughs> face of death and danger and mortal uh, fear or something so these people are chanting his officers are chanting uh, those verses in the quran so then he goes to the bank and you know alauddin receives him warmly and 
before he takes a few steps to escort him, Alauddin gives us gives a signal to one of his assassins. That fellow, you know, attacks him from the back with a sword, and he hits him, lands one blow, and then that blow actually wakes up Jalaluddin, and he turns, you know, astonished, dumbfounded, and he curses Alauddin, "You wretch, you ingrate, or you know whatever." But that doesn't, you know, damage him much. But he falls to the ground. But he lands a second blow on his shoulder, which you know, which cuts him deeply. And after that, it's over. His uh, he's beheaded, and as is customary in all such episodes in in the annals of Islamic history of India, his head is affixed to a spear and paraded everywhere, as far as both in Kada and Manikpur, and as far as in. Um, uh avad province and then later in delhi also so that is how jalaluddin uh, meets his self scripted assassination and alauddin um, crowns is crowned as sultan he doesn't face any resistance in delhi feeble resistance very feeble resistance but See, by the time uh, after uh, you know Jalaluddin is murdered like this, Alauddin says, "Okay, itna sara paisa maine loot liya hai Devagiri se." Throughout the journey, he instructs all his loyalists because everybody is a loyalist now. Which they've, happens? They have seen the future. Which happens in politics? Which happens? Which always happens? Which always happens? Which only happens? Which happens even today? Yeah. Yeah. Happening today? Happening. So. Throughout the journey, and it's a long journey, mind you, from Kada to Delhi. In those days, even today, it's a long journey. Throughout that, you know, he Kada is about fifty kilometers from Prayagraj. From Prayagraj, so it's quite a distance. So, throughout the journey, you know, he, wherever he camps, in all those villages, cities, towns, he keeps literally throwing gold and wealth. He literally buys his way to the throne. and then uh, jalaluddin's wife uh, that queen whatever begum she tries to mount some token resistance but uh, the people who are supposed to fight against alauddin exactly at midnight when they were supposed to launch a night attack they defect to alauddin's camp <laughs> that also happens even today <laughs> you can ask sharad pawar <laughs> good one <laughs> so <laughs> and then it's pointless so uh, jalaluddin's wife and uh, one of his sons so, jalaluddin uh, uh, alauddin they, doesn't they, they run away alauddin doesn't marry his mother in law no no he doesn't <laughs> <laughs> he's actually he he wants to have revenge against his mother in law <laughs> he hates her with a passion and and his first wife that uh, sultana's wife a sultana's daughter uh, she is alauddin's first wife and she is a I have written a tale of two shrews a chapter hai wahan pe a book mein okay so she really tortures him but no credit you know you can't uh, blame alauddin's domestic uh, problems for his ruthlessness or his empire building ambition so a lot of these leftist guys have tried to do that he ye मेरा अब्दुल ऐसा नहीं है तो दैट इज हाउ ही बिकम्स सुल्तान एंड दैट इज वेयर बुक टू ऑफ इनवीडर्स एंड इनफिडल्स एंड्स नाउ अ फ्यू फॉलो अप क्वेश्चंस ऑन दिस व्हाइल वी नो द सिस्टम्स दैट ऑपरेटेड ड्यूरिंग द मुगल टाइम्स एंड ऑल दैट दे हैड सिस्टमेटाइज्ड द एडमिनिस्ट्रेशन टू सम डिग्री हम do you find any systematic administration during this period or it is all loot and plunder and is there any thought given to proper rule proper administration there is a semblance of administration but not administration as we really understand it so uh because we know that during the Until uh, Allah, uh, um, among the Hindu kings, um, there was a tradition of good administration. Ah, there was a legacy of uh, unbroken heritage of administration, which uh, 
you know, prevailed and was maintained intact almost since the Mauryan period or even predating the Mauryan period. You know, in the Buddhist period, almost the same administrative divisions and their functioning and their uh, how each department li you, was linked with the other, the numbers of departments, the names of the titles of the administrative officials, they came down pretty much uh, intact, almost all the uh, all the way till the Wadir time. Yeah. Right. We've seen the administration Hindu, of the Mysore province, uh -huh. one of Hindu, the finest. Yes. Hindu administrative history is quite an extraordinary study. And in fact, during, even during the British times, yeah. the Hindu kingdoms, many Hindu kingdoms, yes. okay, there were exceptions also, but uh, uh, many Hindu kingdoms were better administered than most. Most, yeah, absolutely. Places like Mysore, Mysore, Baroda, Baroda Bikaner, Travancore, Bikaner, Bikaner yeah. and all of them had better... Patiala also. They had better human resource index the, than mm. the British provinces. Than the, yeah, totally true. So what? HDI was far better. For instance, Mysore had a literacy rate of about 25%. Yeah. And British provinces taken to, uh, I think uh, Bengal had 7% hmm. and UP had 6%. 6%. So anyway, uh, they did have some semblance of uh, administration, but most of the history of the so-called Delhi Sultanate is a history, they, they didn't, okay, from... Um, Aiba converts till uh, who's that guy? Ibrahim Lodi. That is roughly the period of the Delhi Sultanate, till, till Babur's invasion. Till that period, you see a series of powerful sultans who did not leave behind a dynasty at all. Okay. Balban didn't leave a dynasty behind. Iltatmish didn't. Jalaluddin Khalji didn't leave a dynasty behind. Neither did Alauddin. Neither did Muhammad bin Tughlaq. Right? So this is a common feature. So they would, there were a series of these individual powerful kings who ruled for say two decades, maximum little more than two decades. So what kind of uh, stable administration can you give? But uh, I'll narrate this story in the next volume, but I'll just give you an outline. It was Jalal, it was Alauddin Khalji who for the first time he uprooted all the existing systems of administration. That much I'll reveal for now. Okay, what was the army organization? Was it a standing army or was it a feudatory army? A combination of both. A combination of both. And uh, what was the harem like? Well, no, I mean, I can't use polite language, but uh, <laughs> the harem... <laughs> <laughs> the harem was, uh, depending on the appetite and the ability and the stamina and the inclination of an individual sultan would be as big as a as 10 football fields or as big as uh, a small town. <laughs> But most of these harems were populated by Hindu women captured as booty in war. What uh, S.L. Barappa has uh, very graphically very described. graphically described. So I think uh, we will end this year. And thank you very much for giving us a glimpse into this colorful history <laughs> of the sultans. The sultans who ruled only nominally but then our historians, they tell us that this was the Sultanate period of a no, Indian history. Our historian, this, uh, uh, okay, this is a great concluding point. I have to add to this. Our eminent historians, basically members or ideologues of the Communist Party, who happen to write books on history. Okay, they are not historians. So you can't be a Marxist and a historian at the same time. That all of our historians are Marxists. Are Marxist historians. So, they don't have much of a problem when you talk about the truths of the period of Delhi Sultanate. Their problem begins with the Mughal period. You notice this marked difference. Why? Because 
the mogul was the only dynasty that carried on a regime for nearly 200 years effectively 150 157 years we can be generous and say 175 years okay effective rule and that is the basis of their myth making of these marxists and out of that they base their myths on one central figure akbar akbar and extrapolate him with all other to all other uh, rulers who followed him so you you deal with the you see the amount of books that these people have written on the so called sultanate period that will tell you a story ah yeah, very few i know it's difficult to, to trace the material correct you have to, you have either eliot or dawson or yes. you get sayed atar abbas rizvi rizvi beyond that k nizami he has written a few books yeah, on that that's very hard to find correct so thank you very much sandeep ji for this enlightening discussion jai hind vande mataram jai hind vande mataram jai shri ram it's always a pleasure being here namaste thank you.